Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this first episode of Prayers and Praises, the Will of God. How often do we say, well, it must be the will of God? We often use that sentence as a consolation of comfort within the context of suffering or pain, crisis or death. What do I mean? Let me offer a prayer and then let's dig into this whole notion of the will of God. Let's pray. Holy God, what is your will for us? How will we know if what we desire or what happens to us is your divine will or just a happenstance? How will we know if we are following your grand design for creation or creating our own grand design? How will we know if you are pleased with our chosen decisions and directions or simply allowing us to exercise our own free will? Holy God, we have a desire to follow your will for our lives, but but too often we are left in a quandary, wondering. Help us to understand you. Help us to follow you. Help us to live by your will. Amen. Well, again, welcome to this exploration of the will of God for this study time together, I am going to be drawing on the classic work of the Reverend Dr. Leslie Weatherhead. He wrote uh, a book that contained five sermons that he preached uh, at the City Temple in London during those tumultuous times of World War II. I'll also be using uh, as a resource uh, a workbook uh, written by Church of the Nazarene minister Rebecca Laird, whose knowledge and insights will be invaluable to our own study. For those who prefer a study of a book of the Bible, have no fear. I will be bringing scriptural references into this study. After all, the will of God as a three-word phrase finds itself in the King James Version of the Bible some 6,275 times. Let's take a just a quick look at some of those instances. Old Testament examples include, well, Proverbs 19, verses 20 to 21. Hear counsel it says, hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. Prophet Micah shares these familiar verses in his book, uh, chapter 6, verse 8. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Now, clearly, we must use some interpretive skills as we discern the meaning of some of the Old Testament biblical verses, the, the counsel of the Lord is the will of God. The Lord's requirements from Micah is again the will of God. Now let's look at a will of God's at the will of God's found in the New Testament. Uh, 
we can turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Or the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 38 through 40. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, and all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Finally, from Matthew uh, chapter 6, we find in Jesus' uh, Sermon on the Mount, uh, <laughs> realize we pray about the will of God every Sunday in worship. We pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, thankfully, the New Testament uses of the will of God are, are more clear. Now let's move into the first of Dr. Weatherhead's sermons. Now, obviously, I'm not going to read these sermons to you. In fact, if you haven't done it yet, I encourage you to purchase the book. It can be yours at Amazon.com for a mere $8.99 plus shipping and handling. I will, though, share excerpts, just as I do right now. This first sermon that Dr. Weatherhead preached begins like this. And remember, remember the context of these sermons. Dr. Weatherhead wrote and delivered these messages in London during World War II. Let me begin. The phrase, the will of God, is used so loosely, and the consequences of that looseness to our peace of mind is so serious that I want to spend some time in thinking through with you the whole subject. There is nothing about which we ought to think more clearly, and yet, sometimes I think there is nothing about which men and women are more confused. <laughs> How's that for a way to begin a sermon? Weatherhead begins this message series by telling the flock gathered that they're confused. And given this subject matter, and in the midst of the tumult of war, <laughs> he's probably right. So, were his listeners confused? Why do I believe that we're confused? Well, Dr. Weatherhead proceeds to respond using a series of illustrations. He says, these are illustrations from his sermons, he says, I have a good friend whose dearly loved wife recently died. And when she died, he said, well, I must just accept it. It is the will of God. But he is himself a doctor, and for weeks he had been fighting for her life. He had called in the best specialists in London. He had used all of the devices of modern science, all of the inventive apparatus by which the energies of nature can be used to fight disease. Was he all that time fighting against the will of God? If she recovered, 
would he have called her recovery the will of God? Yet, surely we cannot have it both ways. The woman's recovery and the woman's death cannot equally be the will of God in the sense of being God's intention. Good illustration, yes. Perhaps you've experienced that very conundrum. I know I have. Here's another. Remember World War II. My boy was killed ten days ago in one of the air raids, said a woman. But I'm trying to bow to the inscrutable will of God. Again, was that the will of God? Or was it the will of the enemy, of Hitler, of the evil forces we were fighting? They the same thing. One last story for this morning. This hits home with me as I reflect and recall being called to the hospital on a Christmas day to console a family in a similar circumstance. Listen to the story. A mother is wringing her hands and weeping in anguish because her baby is dead. Her minister stands by her, longing to comfort her. But though his presence and prayers may offer consolation, he knows only too well that the, when the storm is raging, it is too late to talk about the anchor that should have been put out before the storm began. What I mean is this, is that it's so important that we should try to think clearly before disaster falls upon us. If we do, then in spite of all our grief, we have a foundation, a, a, a philosophy of life that, that can steady us as an anchor steadies a ship. If we don't, the storm is so furious that little can be done until it has abated. Only that minister could have injected into the mind of the mother his his own beliefs about God. But that, alas, is impossible. In her anguish, this is what the mother said. I suppose it is the will of God. But if the doctor had come in time, he would have been able to save my baby. Again, Confusion. If the doctor had come in time, would he have been able to outwit the will of God? Let me offer a guiding scripture, a saying of Jesus that addresses the confusion that can arise in each of these illustrations and, and many of the tragedies that, that befall us today. It is not the will of God. It is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. It's not God's will that people suffer. It's not God's will that people perish by another's hand. It's not God's will that people perish by disease. It's not God's will 
that we should endure pain, suffering. It's not. To help his parishioners and unknowingly to help us, Dr. Weatherhead proposes a, a breakdown of the will of God into three parts. There is the intentional will of God. There is the circumstantial will of God. And there is the ultimate will of God. Now, to conclude our time this morning, I want to try to briefly explain each of these. It will be in the following sessions that we will dig into each more deeply. Dr. Weatherhead suggests that we use the illustration, the event of the crucifixion, as a helpful context, a helpful tool to our understandings. Let's start. Was it God's intention from the beginning that Jesus should go to the cross? Was it God's intention from the beginning that his son should go to the cross? Now, Dr. Weatherhead and I believe the answer to this question has to be, must be, no. No. I don't think that Jesus thought at the beginning of his ministry that that he would end up hanging on the cross. He came with the intention that, that people would, that people should follow him, not kill him. The discipleship of people, not the death of people, was the intentional will of God. Or if you like, God's ideal purpose for creation. Now, this brings us to point number two, but, but when circumstances wrought by humanity's evil through their free will, a dilemma was set up that compelled Christ to either die or run away. And so in those human-made circumstances, the cross became the will of God. But only in those circumstances which were themselves the fruit of evil. The circumstances were not of divine origin. Are you understanding the, the nuances here? The circumstances were not of divine origin. But the, the new direction or the new circumstantial will of God was divine. Jesus says it clearly for us. Not what I will, but what thou wilt. Evil has power only as we allow it to have power over us. And this evil can and does alter the intentional will of God, causing new plans to be initiated, new plans that can bring about can bring about idea number three, the ultimate will of God. Now, the purposefulness of God, which in spite of evil, will not be thwarted. I'm going to say that again. The purposefulness of God, which in spite of evil, will not be thwarted. Thwarted. 
God achieved his goal of renewing his relationship with his children through the forgiveness and the salvation won by his son hanging on that cross. But because of humanity's continuing sinfulness, a circle of sorts is created. There is resolution through the cross, but yet evil persists. Circumstances continue to stymie God's ultimate will. And so we wait. We wait for what we call the second coming. When Jesus will return and establish once and for all God's kingdom. And we continue to pray every Sunday morning, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May this be our prayer now and until God's will is done. Amen. Next week, that's Wednesday, August 11th at 11 o'clock, we're going to explore more deeply this idea of God's intentional will. I hope that you'll join me, and until then, may God bless you and yours.